dissenters in Zion, shall be suddenly seized with fear. Dissenters in Zion often remain secure till they are surprised as with a cry at midnight. They will be as it were awakened out of their secure sleep in a dismal fright. They will see an unexpected calamity coming upon them far more dreadful than they were aware of and coming in an unexpected season. With respect to the time when the wicked shall be thus surprised with fear, it is often so on a deathbed. Many things pass in their lifetime, which one would think might well strike terror into their souls, is when they see others die, who are as young as they are, in a polite condition and circumstances with themselves, whereby they may see how uncertain their lives are, and how unsafe their souls. It may well surprise many sinners to consider how old they are grown, and are yet in a Christless state, how much of their opportunity to get an interest in Christ is irrecoverably gone, and how little remains. Also, how much greater their disadvantages now are than they have been, but these things do not terrify them. As age increases, so does the hardness and obduracy of their hearts grow upon them. But when death comes, then the sinner is often filled with astonishment. It may be, when he is first taken sick, he has great hope that he shall recover. Men are ready to flatter themselves with hopes that things will be as they would like to have them. But when the distemper comes to prevail much upon him, and he sees that he is going into eternity, when he sees that all the medicines of physicians are in vain, that all the care and endeavors of friends are to no purpose, that nothing seems to help him, that his strength is gone, that his friends weep over him and look upon his cases desperate, when he sees by the countenance and behavior of the doctor, that he looks upon his case as past hope, and perhaps overhears a whispering in the room, in which his friends signify one to another, that they look upon it that he is struck with death, or wherein they tell one another that his extreme hearts grow cold, that his countenance and manner of breathing and his pulse indicate death, and that he begins to be in a cold death, sweat, and when perhaps by and by someone thinks himself bound in duty and faithfulness to let him know the worst, and therefore comes and asks him whether or not he be sensible that he is a dying, then how does fearfulness surprise the sinner in Zion? How does his heart melt with fear? This is a thing which he feared ever since he was taken sick, but until now he had hoped that he should recover the doctor did not speak, or if he despaired, he spoke of such and such medicines as being very proper, and he hoped that they would be effectual, and when these failed, he changed his medicines and applied something new. Then the sinner hoped that would be effectual. Thus, although he constantly grew worse and worse, still he hoped to recover. At the same time, he cried to God to spare him and made promises how he would live if God would spare him, and he hoped that God would hear him. He observed also that his friends and perhaps the pastor seemed to pray earnestly for him, and he could not but hope that those prayers would be answered, and he should be restored. But now, how does his heart sink and die within him? How does he look about with a frighted countenance? How quick is the motion of his eye through inward fear, and how quick and sudden are all his motions? What a frightful hurry does he seem to be in. How does everything look to him when he sees pale, grim death, staring him in the face, and a vast eternity within a few hours or minutes of him? It may be he struggles for a little hope. He is loath to believe what is told him. He tells his informers that he hopes that they are more affrighted than they need be. He hopes that those symptoms arise from some other cause, and like a poor drowning man he catches at slender and brittle twigs and clenches his hands about whatever he sees within his reach. 
But as death creeps more and more on him, he sees his twigs break. All his hopes of life fail, and he sees he must die. Oh, there is nothing but death before him. He has been hoping, but his hopes are all dashed. He sees this world and all that belongs to it are gone. Now come the thoughts of hell into his mind with amazement. Oh, how shall he go out of the world? He knows he has no interest in Christ. His sins stare him in the face. Oh, the dreadful gulf of eternity. He had been crying to God, perhaps, since he was sick, to save him. And if he had some hope, if it were his last sickness, yet that God would pity him and give him pardoning grace before he should die. He begged and pleaded, and he hoped that God would have pity on his poor soul. At the same time, he asked others to pray for him, and he had been looking day after day for some light to shine into his soul. But alas, now he's dying, and his friends ask him how death appears to him, whether any light appear whether God has not given him some token of his favor, and he answers no with a poor, faltering, trembling voice, if able to speak at all, or if his friends ask a signal of hope, he can give none. Now death comes on him more and more, and he is just on the brink of eternity. Who can express the fear? The misgivings, the hangings back, and the horrible fright and amazement of his soul. Some who in such circumstances have been able to speak, have been known to cry out, Oh, eternity, eternity, and some, oh, a thousand worlds for an inch of time. Oh, if they might but live a little while longer. But it must not be, go they must. They feel the frame of nature dissolving and perceive the soul is just going. For sometimes the exercise of reason seems to hold to the last. What in such a case is felt in the soul? In those last moments, when it is just breaking its bands with the body, about to fetch its leap on the edge of eternity in the very brink of hell without any savior, or the least testimony of divine mercy. What is sometimes felt by Christless souls in those moments none can tell, nor is it within the compass of our conception. The misery of the departed soul of a sinner, besides what it now feels, consists in a great part in amazing fears of what is yet to come. When the union of the soul and body is actually broken, and the body has fetched its last gasp, the soul forsakes its old habitation, and then falls into the hands of devils, who fly upon it and seize it more violently than ever hungry lions flew upon their prey, and with what horror will it fall into those cruel hands? If we imagine to ourselves, the dreadful fear with which a lamb or kid falls into the paws of a wolf, which leaves hold of it with open mouth. Or if we imagine to ourselves a feeling of a little child that has been pursued by a lion when it is taken hold of and sees a terrible creature opening his devouring jaws to tear it in pieces. Or the feeling of those two and forty children who had mocked Elisha when they fell into the paws of the bears that tear them in pieces. If we could have but a perfect idea of that terror and astonishment which a little child has in such a case, yet we should have but a faint idea of what is felt in the departing soul of a sinner when it falls into the hands of those cruel devils, those roaring lions which then seize of it. And when the soul is carried to hell, and there is tormented, and suffering the wrath of the Almighty, and is overwhelmed and crushed with it, it will also be amazed with the apprehensions of what shall yet remain. To think of an eternity of this torment remaining. Oh, how will it feel and overbear and sink down the wretched soul? How will the thought of the duration of this torment without end cause? a heart to melt like wax. How will the thought of it sink the soul into the bottomless pit of darkness and gloominess? 
even those proud and sturdy spirits, the devils tremble at the thoughts of that greater torment which they are to suffer at the day of judgment, so will the poor damned souls of men. They have already more than they will be able to bear. How then will they tremble at the thought of having their misery so vastly augmented? Persons sometimes in this world are afraid of the day of judgment. If there be an earthquake, or if there be more than common thunder and lightning, or if there be some unusual sight in the heavens, their hearts are ready to tremble for fear that the day of judgment is at hand. Oh, then, how do the poor souls in hell fear it, who know so much more about it, who know by what they feel already and know certainly that whenever it comes they shall stand on the left hand of the judge to receive the dreadful sentence, and that then in soul and body they must enter into those everlasting burnings which are prepared for the devil and his angels and who probably know that their misery is to be an hundredfold greater than it is now. Fearfulness will surprise them at the last judgment, when Christ shall appear in the clouds of heaven, and the last trumpet shall sound. Then will the hearts of wicked men be surprised with fear. Poor damned soul, in expectation of it, trembles every day and every hour from the time of its departure from the body. It knows not indeed when it is to be, but it knows it is to be. But when the alarm is given in hell that the day is come, it will be a dreadful alarm indeed. It will, as it were, fill the caverns of hell with shrieks, and when the souls of the damned shall enter into their bodies, it will be with amazing horror horror of what is coming, and when they shall lift up their heads out of their graves, and shall see the judge, it will be a most terrible sight. Gladly would they return into their graves again, and hide themselves there, if that might be, and gladly would they return into hell, their former state of misery, to hide themselves from this awful sight, if that would excuse them. So those sinners in Zion who shall then be found alive on the earth, when they shall see this sight, will be surprised with fear. The fear and horror which many poor sinners feel when they are dying is great, and beyond all that of which we can have any idea. But that is nothing to the horror that will seize them when they shall come to see this sight. There will not be a wicked man upon earth who will be able to bear it. Let him be who he will, let him be rich or poor, old or young, male or female, servant or master, king or subject, learned or unlearned. Let him be ever so proud, ever so courageous, and ever so sturdy. There is not one who will be able to to support himself when he shall see this sight. It will immediately sink his spirit. It will lose the joints of his loins. It will make his countenance more ghastly than death. The rich captains and valiant generals and princes, who now scorn to show any fear at the face of an enemy, who scorn to tremble at the roaring of a cannon, will tremble and drink when they shall hear the last trumpet and see the majesty of their judge. It will make their teeth to chatter, and make them fly to hide themselves in the caves and rocks of the mountains, cry into the rocks and mountains to fall on them, and cover them from the wrath of the judge. Fearfulness will surprise them when they shall be dragged before the judgment seat. The wicked hang back when they are about to meet death, but in no measure as they will hang back when they come to meet their great judge. And when they come to stand before the judge and are put on his left hand, fearfulness and amazement will surprise them. The majesty of the judge will be intolerable to them. His pure and holy eye, which will behold and search them and pierce them through, will be more terrible to their souls a thousand times than flashes of lightning piercing their hearts. There will they stand in a trembling expectation that by and by they shall hear the words of that dreadful sentence proceed out of the mouth of Christ. They will have a horrible expectation of that sentence. And what shall they do? Where shall they fly so as to be out of its hearing? They cannot shut their ears so as not to hear it. Fearfulness will surprise them when the sentence shall come to be pronounced. 
at the close of the judgment, that dreadful doom will be uttered by the judge, and it will be the most terrible voice that ever was heard. The sound of the last trumpet that shall call men to judgment will be a more terrible sound to wicked men than ever they shall have heard till that time. But the sound of the last sentence will be much more terrible than that. There will not be one of all those millions at the left hand, whether high or low, king or subject, who will be able to support himself at all under the sound of that sentence, but they will all sink under it. Lastly, fearfulness will surprise them when they shall come to see the fire kindle upon the world in which they are to be tormented for ever. When a sentence shall have been pronounced, Christ, with his blessed saints and glorious angels, will leave this lower world and ascend into heaven. Then will the flames begin to kindle, and fire will probably be seen coming down from heaven, and soon will the fire lay hold of that accursed multitude. Then will their hearts be surprised with fearfulness. That fire will appear a dreadful fire indeed. Oh, what chatterings of teeth, what shaking of loins, what distortions of body will there be at that time when they shall see and begin to feel the fierceness of the flames. What shall they do? Where shall they go to avoid those flames? Where shall they hide themselves that they creep into holes or creep into caves of the earth? Yea, if they could creep down to the center of the earth, it will be in vain, for it will set on fire the bottoms of the mountains and burn to the lowest hell. They will see no place to fly to, no place to hide themselves, then their hearts will be filled with fearfulness and will utterly sink in despair. Thus it shall hereafter be with every one that shall then be found to be a sinner, especially sinners in Zion.